and that's the problem I think with the area as a whole is that you know, you just get these blanket assumptions about CBD, cannabis, THC, and then there's no studies to back them up in humans. It, what are you talking about? Smoking it in a bong or blunt. Grass. Dang. Reefer. It just means like, that's the fucking joint. Ganja. Hash. <laughs> fucking awesome. <laughs> Hello and welcome back to Exploring Cannabis and Exercise. This week I'm talking with fe- fellow cannabis and exercise researcher, Dr. Matt Schubert from CSU San Marcos. He and I started a group of cannabis and exercise researchers last year called SPACE, or also known as sport, physical activity, cannabis, and exercise, where we talk about the research we're up to and any potential areas of research we want to explore with people from all around the world. A lot of people in Colorado and really just a lot of different states and different countries that are really starting to explore this this new field of, of interest. So it's been really fun to have a shared community of fellow researchers. I'm sure I'll eventually do an episode with each and every one of them because we're all interested in slightly different aspects of cannabis and exercise. So this episode is really great for anyone who wants to know what it's like for two exercise science professors to talk about cannabis and exercise. All right, now let's explore. All right. Hi, Dr. Schubert. Uh, Good to see you again today. And um, welcome to the podcast to talk about your own experience with doing um, cannabis related research at CSU San Marcos. So um, uh, tell me a little bit about um, yourself and and how you got to where you are right now. Yeah, great. Thanks for uh, having me, Dr. Ogle. It's a great pleasure to be here and talk about some of our shared interests around exercise and um, cannabis. So let's see. Uh, I've always been a active person. I would probably qualify myself as a lifelong endurance athlete. There's been a couple of offshoots during that time, but probably the one constant, trying to do the math here, probably the one constant since about 2000 has been uh, running primarily. And so throughout high school and early part of college, um, primarily ran cross country track and field. And before that had been a swimmer, a lot of different endurance sports, but like I've, like most people growing up played soccer, baseball, all those things. Were you, were you of, also a distance swimmer? I was, yeah. So that's kind of why I ended up going into distance running. And it, and it basically came to a point where about my sophomore year in high school, I reached a point where it was time for a divergence, if you will, and just saw more potential with running as opposed to swimming. Um, because I hadn't really done a lot of running up to that point. It, was, it had mostly been swimming. So the aerobic background was there, but not necessarily the uh, sport-specific skills. Right. And so kind of with that in mind, um, probably like a number of listeners and or just people in general um, went into college thinking I would major in one thing uh, and ended up doing something different. Initially wanted to do criminal justice or, or criminology, so studying kind of the criminal justice system, maybe at one point down the line, um, going into federal law enforcement. And then how did you how did you get interested yeah, in that? How did I pivot? Well, that, I think that, it, it I mean, goes it goes back to kind yeah. of the situation. Well, not the situation, but it kind of goes back to like the culture and kind of what I was raised in. Um and, and, and where was that? So I grew up on the East Coast outside of uh, Philadelphia. I was okay. born in Seattle, though, um, and so I'm a. I have a very close link to Seattle. Go Seahawks! And <laughs> um, you know the West Coast has always been. And we moved out to the West Coast my sophomore year of high school. Um, okay. So lived on the East Coast about 14 years, and then finished high school out here. First year of college, I went to the University of New Mexico. Um, some things didn't work out personally at that time. So I came back home and um, finished my undergrad degree here at Cal State San Marcos. And then uh, while I was finishing up my undergrad, I got into coaching at the high school level, uh, track and field and cross country. Uh, And at that time, wanted to go into coaching at the college level. And so 
changed majors over to kinesiology, went through all that, got to learn all about how exercise influences the human body, which like that's my bread and butter because mm-hmm. uh, I'm, I'm an exercise physiologist by training. And so we are interested in how does exercise or inactivity uh, influence the overall body. So the body overall, but we can also look at individual systems like the cardiovascular system. So, so, after I so my, you're, oh, you're go ahead. into you were like in the um, criminal justice kind of realm, but you wanted to get into coaching. Um, All right. So, so that's after that's like a semester, I was a psychology. I think I moved to psychology for like a semester, and then I moved into um, kinesiology. I think I started out thinking of maybe going down the PE teaching road, mm-hmm. but that didn't really appeal to me. Um, yeah, me neither. And so. I, after I finished undergrad, I went up to um, Chico State in NorCal for my master's. They have a very strong um, cross-country track and field program, one of the top programs in Division II in the, definitely in the state of California, if not, um, you know, one of the top 10, 20 programs in the nation. And so it was a really good opportunity to work with some very skilled athletes and, um, And that was good because it allowed me to take kind of what I had learned during undergrad and apply it to actual humans, Um, you know, so learning about or seeing the applications of like the lactate threshold in action, for example, um, which is this physiological marker that roughly approximates the barrier between exercise that can be sustained for long periods of time and exercise that can't. Um, And so with like a distance runner, for example, you could use their threshold to prescribe exercise intensity for different kinds of workouts. Training below the threshold is going to improve the body in some areas and training above the threshold will improve it in others. So just like anything with exercise, uh, different stimuli is going to have different results. One of the things that I guess I learned more of like the more and more like education I did was um, there's, there's actually like a lot to exercise, you know, and, and it's funny how like out in the world um, I don't know if people really truly understand like what exercise science and kinesiology and, or like exercise physiology really even is. Cause it's just like, Oh yeah. Like do rep. This is, this is like a really intense actually field of study. And it's really, much deeper than what, um, what people normally, I don't know, think of when they think of exercise science. What do you do? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and so what were you kind of, um, focusing in on, um, during your master's? Yeah. Um, so I was particularly interested at that time in looking at, uh, caffeine and athletic performance. And this would have been back in the background, 2010, uh, 2011, and I feel like five hour energy had only been around for a few years by that point. And about that same time, Red Bull came out with their own version of five hour energy. It was basically a two ounce shot. And so that kind of took me in this area of, okay, we know caffeine potentially can improve performance. Energy drinks might be a way to do that. But the concern there, especially um, in my case, because I was focused on runners in particular, drinking a Red Bull and then going and racing, it might not work out so well for your gastrointestinal tract, (laughs) you know, because you got the carbonation, there's caffeine in there, sugar, some things that might cause, you know, diarrhea or other issues. Yeah. And so that kind of was like, well, if we can't have them drink a full can of Red Bull or something like that, maybe these smaller versions that basically have the same ingredients as the larger ones, um, but don't have carbonation. I don't think they had to be refrigerated. Um, and obviously we're very small, um, you know, would those potentially be more applicable, um, in an athletic population? So did a really small thesis. I had, I had four subjects that finished the study, um, that I presented data on, and then I managed to get a couple more and managed to publish um, this paper, but we basically compared a Red Bull energy shot to a placebo and a organic energy shot, a yerba mate energy Mm -hmm. shot by a company called uh, Guayaquil, which is based up in NorCal somewhere, I think. Um, 
had the athletes come in, gave them the shot. 45 minutes later, they did a little warm up, and then they did a 5K uh, time trial on the treadmill. And we didn't see any differences. Probably a type two error, just not having enough subjects. Yeah. And but so, and you were looking at like the dependent variable, you're looking at like the time. Um, finish time. The time yeah. Trial? Okay. So how fast were they able to finish? We also collected right. um, gas exchange data. So measured VO2, carbon dioxide production, which gives us carbohydrate and fat use during exercise. Uh, what else did we do? Blood lactate. And then Is there RPE any difference in, in like heart scales. rate? No, I don't think so. I'd have to go find the paper, but I'm yeah. I'm almost positive no because of the relative intensity they were exercising at. Right. It okay. was they were not exercising at to the level of their personal best, which I think is largely due to them being on the treadmill. Yeah. Um, but they were exercising at about ninety-seven to ninety-eight percent of their max. So pretty close to you yeah. know going as hard as they could. Yeah. Um and so that pretty much guaranteed the heart rates were all pretty similar. Um, I think RPE might have been slightly lower in the Red Bull condition, which mm -hmm. based on some of what we know about um, the actions of caffeine, uh, that is supported by the research that caffeine will either lower RPE at the same intensity, or um, it might potentially allow somebody to work a little bit harder um, at a given intensity. Yeah. So, okay. Two things. My, my brain's going in like a thousand different directions now, but one of the things is um, when you, when you uh, did the study, did the IRB, like the institutional review board, did they have any concerns about the health or anything of, of the participants going through? Was there anything about like, oh gosh, caffeine, you have to do a special, you know, any kind of like risk management thing? No, not at all. Um, one, they were all healthy male track and field athletes under probably like 25. Um, Which is pretty common were, for exercise were, physiology. Yeah, research. they were all <laughs> probably like under 15% body fat. But anyway, okay. um, no, the IRB didn't because the dose that we were giving them was pretty minor. And but it is that is a good question because there was an incident that happened in the UK, I think like a year or two years ago where they – they they measured the caffeine doses wrong. And I think they basically misplaced the decimal. And so they ended up giving them doses that were like 10 or a hundred times higher than they thought. Whoa, whoa, yeah, whoa. That's why you don't let students measure out caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Or like double check it. My goodness. Mm -hmm. Um, and then did the participants have to have, um, any exp like previous experience with caffeine or anything? Uh, I th think so, but the habitual caffeine consumption wasn't particularly high. Got um, it. Okay. I don't think it was more than like 100 to 150 milligrams a day. Yeah. Okay. And, and the reason why I'm asking these questions is because I want people to know like, how people are able to do research with other substances versus yes. what it's like to do research with cannabis. So we're just going to like couch that for a second. Um, and uh, the other thing that you said about the the Red Bull um, that um, perhaps affected the rate of perceived exertion, like you don't think that you're working as hard, um, even though you're like potentially like at, at your max. Um, I've been, I learned how to do a Rubik's cube last fall and I've been collecting my data on like how long it takes me to do the whole cube. Um, so I have like some cool graphs that I've made for myself because <laughs> I just can't like do an activity without trying to like think about how to, how to like turn it into a graph. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a lot of fun in my brain. Um, but um, I, Red Bull is like, that's my thing that I went to towards the end of the semester like that's my like all right it's finals week let's go um and so I started to use like you know going back to Red Bull at the end of the semester when I I'm in that place now as a professor like all right I have a lot of, I have a lot of grading to do you know like let's let's do this so I I was like oh gosh I can't wait to see what happens to my Rubik's Cube performance when I'm uh having Red Bull in my system and I, I was working through it and I realized I was like way more jittery and like, you know, than I, than I used to be felt like I was doing awesome and like was way, way slower actually than I, than I normally am. And so it was, 
Um, so I did it a couple times, you know, replication mm -hmm. and, um, and still the same thing. Like I, I was actually slower, even though I felt like, yeah, I did this. Uh, I felt really good about it. I was actually slower. So I, I felt like that was super interesting and um, counterintuitive from what I was expecting. But yeah, okay. So that was your master's um, focusing on caffeine. And then mm -hmm. what happened next? Yeah. And then so uh, finished my master's, started looking for coaching jobs. This was 2011. So kind of the peak of that last recession we've had. Um, I probably applied for between 40 to 60, maybe got like five interviews. Um, and I think at that same time, I was starting to realize that maybe college coaching is not something I want to do because recruiting is a very, very big part of the job. I realized that like that part of the job, which was going to be the majority of it, was not something I wanted to do. And I had enjoyed the research experience enough. Um, going back to some stuff I had done during my undergrad and then also my thesis that I started to look at PhDs, potentially going on and doing a PhD for research purposes. And then after that, you know, who knows, stay in research, go into academia, whatever. I guess I'll just, I'll just very briefly talk about um, my PhD research. So yeah, kind of cool. continued down the caffeine path, but wanted to kind of put a spin on it to kind of make it unique. And about the time I was going into my PhD, I'd gotten exposed to um, some of the work around exercise, energy, or food intake, uh, and some of the hormones involved in both energy balance, so the calories in, calories out kind of thing, uh, as well as appetite regulation. And so we did some studies where we were looking at how um, – coffee with your breakfast in the morning influences your gastric emptying or how fast the food moves from your stomach to your intestines. Hmm. I think most people anecdotally would say that, you know, that first sip of coffee in the morning kind of gets things started uh, down below. <laughs> um, and, but in our study, we didn't, we didn't see that. And I think that could have been due to the fact that we gave them the coffee with a meal as mm -hmm. opposed to them like having a couple sips on an empty stomach. Um, but then to follow that study up, we took non-athletes, so just kind of regular exercisers, um, had them come into the lab, gave them caffeine, had them exercise for an hour. And then a couple hours later, we did a, a test meal where we asked them to eat as much as they wanted. And we found that when we gave them caffeine – they had a lower effort during exercise or perceived effort rather. Uh, they had an increased perception of enjoyment, which we did the uh, physical activity enjoyment scale. That's a pretty standard tool to assess that with caffeine. So exercise was a little bit easier and a little more enjoyable with caffeine. Um, and then they actually ate, I can't remember the exact number. I want to say they ate about 250 calories less at lunch. Huh. Um so just some kind of interesting takes of maybe looking to see if, you know, can caffeine be used as a, a way to maybe increase exercise adherence, all speculative at that point. But um, once that, once I uh, kind of finished those studies, I came back to the States and did a, um, about a year and a half of postdoc work at uh, the University of Kansas Medical Center mm -hmm. in their center for weight management and uh, physical activity. So primarily a, a kind of weight loss clinic, um, doing a lot of clinical trials. So lots of subjects, lots of variables collected, but not a lot of control uh, over those subjects and what they do. Interesting. Interesting. So then you ended up back at your alma mater, back at CSU mm -hmm. San Marcos. And I know, I mean, we, we know each other now because we were connected from a, a mutual um, a colleague who was like, oh, you guys are both doing cannabis stuff. You should meet each other. And so how did you go from doing like the caffeine weight management stuff into the cannabis realm? Sure. Yeah. So to kind of paraphrase my uh, PhD mentor, the drug, he says legal drug research is what they do. I just kind of find the interactions between drugs and metabolism to be pretty interesting. It took me a little bit to get down this route. And before the pandemic, I had started to move in this direction by wanting to look at if long-term 
usage of antidepressant medication had negative impacts on metabolic health. Hmm. Um, Because like anecdotally, you'll hear stories of people getting put on antidepressants and they'll gain 10, 15, 20 pounds in a rather short period of time. Yeah. Although it's only reported as a very minor side effect in terms of the clinical trial data for most of the medications. But nobody's looked and seen like, okay, well, if somebody's been taking this drug for five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, what does that do to the body? Um, And just given how much of the population is on these medications these days, I feel like kind of important question. I got a little bit of internal money to look into it, but by the time I was starting the study, the pandemic happened. And so that's just fallen to the back burner. Yeah. Um, but that kind of stimulated this idea. A few other factors contributed as well of wanting to look at the interactions between different medications and drugs and exercise. But yeah, coming back, how I got into the like in drugs and how drugs affect, um, uh, performance and, and weight. And so, and obviously we're in California and, and I think we started like the same time in like fall of 2017. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we're both going for 10 year right now. Um, (laughs) wish us luck. Yay. We can do it. Oh my gosh. It was right before legalization of recreational cannabis, but medical was already like around. Um, so like when I first moved out here, my partner at the time who had, who got a medical card, like he was able to go to the dispensaries and get us weed within a semester, like in January, that's when it became legal. And then I could go into the stores too. And so it it, it was like an interesting time to be in California to watch that, that change happen. It was like a huge shift for me going from Indiana, where it was like super duper, not legal to, um, to Humboldt, where it's just like, there's not a day that I go by without just smelling it wafting in the (laughs) air or like, you know, watching someone roll a joint, like at the, at the, at a bar. And it's like, oh my gosh, what is this place? <laughs> right. So did you have like a similar thing going from, from Kansas to California? Well, so I had actually, it was actually coming from a, so after I left, I left Kansas in the end of 2015 and took a, my first tenure track job at a school in Alabama after that. Got it. Um, so I actually came here from Alabama, but I wasn't oh, wow. really in like I was aware of kind of the legalizations and stuff I was not using at that time. And when I first moved back, it wasn't really something I paid much attention to. But as part of kind of a quest for pain relief, better sleep, a few other things, um, after it was made legal recreationally, that is when I started kind of exploring. Interesting. So I I feel like maybe with... um, well, I guess like I'll back up some. Um, I had smoked a few times in high school. I probably smoked more in high school than I drank, probably yeah. like four to five versus like two to three. Yeah. Um, but then didn't really like, and in between then and when I moved back, you know, occasionally there'd be times where, you know, you run into somebody at a party who's got a joint or something and you take a hit or whatever, but yeah. it wasn't something that I used with any sort of regularity at all. Um all right. And then as one of the issues I have is um, I have Haglund's deformity in both my heels. I don't know Mm -hmm. if you're familiar with that, Mm -hmm. but um, basically it is a bony growth at the back of the heel about the point where the Achilles tendon inserts. Mm -hmm. And in some situations, this bony growth can damage or irritate the tendon. Uh, In my case, it's more impacted the uh, bursa back there at both at the back of both heels and you know it it had gotten to a point where the pain was pretty significant um i could kind of gut my way through most exercise with it but you know a couple hours later or the following morning would be walking with very pronounced limp uh very chopped stride and realized i couldn't keep doing like 2000 to 2400 milligrams of ibuprofen every day (laughs) You know, not oh not God. being not yeah. being very good for the uh, the stomach, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's when I kind of started to look at the potential opportunities that cannabis might have. Yeah. And probably like a lot of people looking at it for pain management, started with edibles mm-hmm. and used those for 
probably three to six months, you know, we just take them like seven o'clock at night. So that by nine o'clock, nine 30, I'd be ready to go to bed or whatever. Yeah. Um, and when you were going to the stores and stuff, what, like what went into the process of like buying one product over another? Yeah. You know, it, it was mostly just kind of the, you know, if this products look legit, um, <laughs> I think I might've gotten a recommendation from a, a bud tender. I don't specifically remember, but I knew that the stereotypical, the sativa is more of like the head high, the go out and do stuff kind of strain. And the indica is more of the, the body high, the kind of pain numbing and whatnot. So I, I focus mostly on and still do mostly use um, indica or hybrid or indica heavy hybrids. Yeah. Um, sativa is not really my thing. Yeah. And, and like for like before bed, um, and were you also looking at, at like THC versus CBD? Yes. I'm going to, I'll come out and just say it right now. I'm not convinced CBD is particularly effective for a number of things. Uh, oh, um, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Tell me more about that. <laughs> well, it's, I, I, <sighs> I, I, I say it that way to, because, I mean, people are just so gospel-y about, yeah. about CBD and yeah. it's like, this is going to change the world. And it's, I don't know, there's like not a... It's like, show me the data. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I know. And so, and like, yeah, I really even struggle, the, yeah, the, um, yeah. even going to like dispensaries sometimes, like when, when people are, when people say like, oh yeah, you really need a CBN for sleep. And it's like, I've not seen that study ever. Like I've, I've never once seen a study looking at CBN and sleep in human participants. Like maybe mm -hmm. it exists. I haven't seen it. And I feel like I look at the research all the time. So um, it's like frustrating to hear like the anecdotes of people being like so proselytizing about it while yeah. I just know that the research is like not super there. And that's the problem I think with the area as a whole is that you know, you just get these blanket assumptions about CBD, cannabis, THC, and then there's no studies to back them up in humans. It, you know, maybe there's a, um, maybe there's a mouse model or a rat model or a cell model, but that's not the same thing. Right. And then you run into other there's issues. There's no room for that kind of research, and I'm super happy those kind of people exist. That is not at all my research, and and, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I need to see it like actually in people. Like, how many hours of sleep did you get? Like, let's take a look. You know, I I can't just base things on cells and mice. Right. Yeah. Well, we're hoping, um, I have a, a PhD, so a friend of mine who's actually doing his PhD. It's, it's basically an offshore program. So he's registered at a school in New Zealand, but he'll collect his data here. Interesting. And his PhD is going to focus primarily on, um, CBD and, uh, endurance athletes. So we have a series of studies we've designed and are hoping to start later this fall. The first one will be a muscle damage study. And so there's a number of these studies out there. I think there's a there's four or five now, I think. Um, but they all pretty much use the same design of eccentric exercise to cause muscle damage mm -hmm. and then provide CBD. And then over 24, 48, 72 hours, uh, they assess perceived soreness. Some of them look at some biomarkers of muscle damage, like um, creatine kinase. So that's an enzyme for the listeners. That's an enzyme that gets uh, basically leaches out into the blood from the muscle and gets elevated when there's significant muscle damage. So like after a heart attack, for example, CK levels are very elevated. Um, and is that, so you, you just take, like, take a blood sample of that? Is that how you do that? Okay. Yeah, you can detect it in uh, venous or arterial blood. Um, Got it. So CK is probably the most common. You can and is also that do... how people look at, like, is that like when people say like, oh, it's good for like inflammation. Is that what you would look at when you're looking at inflammation? I would probably use C-reactive protein. Okay. I can't tell you what the C stands for off the top of my head. But I, I think most people, when they look at inflammation, it's CRP is generally okay. what they use. Yeah. Um, and I think that Johnny Lozano and the group out at yeah, I got University that. of Northern Colorado. Right. I think that they, they've they done some of that research. And I know that he talked about it a little bit in the episode. And I have to like really try hard to not zone out because any time that you get into any of these names, uh, like C-reactive protein, it's like, this is why I hate biochem. 
culture. <laughs> it's yeah. like, if this could be named something more interesting, then I could maybe be into it. But uh, yeah, that's really interesting. So you're looking at the the breakdown of the muscle after an eccentric exercise and then looking at uh, like a CBD edible versus... I think we're going to be using pills. Um, he has, he owns a couple gyms and one of his gym members works for a, a company here locally and is, we're going to be able to get the product for free. So nice. um, I think it'll primarily be pills. Uh, I think they'll probably also provide the placebo and we might use a, probably we'll use a third party company just to verify. But mm-hmm. um, I know compared to other states, the Canna safe program or whatever it's called here, I think what they report is pretty much what is in the product. It's interesting because we're both part of the California State University system. So like when I was out in Colorado at this uh, ACSM Rocky Mountain, I was like in awe that all of these researchers are like able to have these partnerships with a CBD company who's provided the samples of like different milligram amounts of CBD and THC. And, and it was like, oh my God, like we... The, there's a there's a group here in town that um, a company here in town Papa and Barkley, who in the past have been interested in like you know partnering with us and and doing research with us, but the way that the legal system has told us is that we can't accept money from them because then that would be seen as us as the university trafficking drug money because the majority of their sales come from selling drugs, and so there it's been this really frustrating process of like. I can walk, I can walk to like five dispensaries from campus and, and yet we can't do research on cannabis and human subjects, even though we're in California as part of the largest state university system, this makes no sense. And so, um, so yeah, like what have you, have you run into any of those problems as well? Or is like San Marcos a little bit more cool somehow than humble yeah i i think our irb is a little bit more lenient so when i so this the study that he's going to be doing kind of takes its design from a study that we had proposed back in i think it was the spring of 2020 um or maybe it was 2019 i don't remember basically we had we had proposed a study where there'd be a cbd arm and a thc arm Mm -hmm. to look at muscle damage and the IRB told me that, you know, as long as we had the appropriate federal clearance and whatnot, that they didn't think it would be an issue. But obviously, we didn't get funded, so that study didn't happen. Um, <laughs> in terms of current research, I think the biggest thing that they have been weary about is collecting any data on cannabis use before the age of 18. Yeah. Which I understand that, but at the same time, we're collecting the data anonymously. And I don't see how that would be any different than asking about underage drinking. Yeah. And I basically told the IRB the same thing. (laughs) They didn't really seem, I mean, they didn't really seem uh, that bothered by it. Uh But yeah, if I was going to do, if I was going to do something where I was going to give them THC or have them smoke a joint or something like that, then I'm sure that would create larger issues as you are very well aware. And, you know, you talked about with Dr. Brian and some of the other people on this podcast. Yeah. I mean, Dr. I mean, Dr. Brian, like the folks at University of Colorado, like they, they figured out the model, like, okay, so you guys can't say that we can't have any weed on campus. Fine. We'll get it. We'll get a van and bring it Mm -hmm. to the, you know, bring it to people's houses, but we can't give them product. All right, fine. We we tell them to go to the the dispensary, get you know one of these products, and then they use that, and we reimburse them. It's yeah, they've they figured out how to get around the system. So um, hopefully, once we get tenure, then uh, we can be a little bit more bold as well. I'm just well, trying to not rock too many. <laughs> sure. Well, the other thing I think is, and and obviously this would not be maybe quite as relevant to our work, but. Um, during my, one of my PhD studies, I had a, a participant who had participated in another study uh, at a different university in Australia that was funded by that um, territory's law enforcement agency, hmm. where they wanted to know the effects of getting crossfaded on driving performance. Yeah. So he said, I came into the lab, they gave me vodka and orange juice, 
based on my body weight, took me outside, made me smoke a joint, brought me back inside, put me in a driving simulator. <laughs> and that was funded by the the state police because this was something, you know, they want to know how it impacted uh, breath alcohol concentrations and, and performance in a driving simulator. Wow. So I don't know if that wow. would be something we could do here, maybe approaching some of the law enforcement agencies, but that opens a whole other can of ickiness of, yeah. you know, despite something that is technically legal in California, people are still being arrested for it. So, and people are still in prison for it. Yeah. It's exactly. wild. Yeah. There, I was just explaining. So I'm the other part of my training is in, in, in physical therapy. So I'm constantly thinking about ergonomics and stuff as well. And so like, what are the common injuries that happen in growers? Mm -hmm. And um, there's been a couple of of studies, I mean, like not a lot of studies looking at the effects of like farming practices um, on like like health and ergonomic stress. But there is one where if you look at the methods section, it's like basically the police did a raid of an indoor grow in Colorado. And, and then the researchers came in afterward and then did like swabs of all the surfaces to find all the potentially problematic inhalants that people are, you know, inhaling all throughout the day. And it's like, Wow. <laughs> Started with a raid and then we did research. And so it, it's like, God, that felt so icky as well. Back to like the the research world now, you know, and, and you've said this a couple of times, like, this, you know, with the, the caffeine and then also with this person who got drunk <laughs> yeah. um, for this driving simulator study doing it as a, as a percent of body weight how are you what do you think is the right way when when we are able to give someone cannabis for a study what do you think is like the best way to standardize that yeah that is a that is one of the the great questions isn't it yeah. um i have a paper around here somewhere some international consensus article where i think they recommended that the standard dose be 5 milligrams interesting but my concern there is yeah, there, there's just so much variability in products and especially with the portable vaping devices or the e-cigarettes. You know, I think if you look at the the vials of the concentrate, it, re it says like the dose is based on a three second draw. Mm. I don't know too many people who are only hitting those things for three seconds. Mm. And so they're getting you know, they're, they're more than likely getting a higher dosage than what is recommended. And, you know, same kind of thing with, with joints, right. Um, or especially if you're buying like pre-rolls, you know, and I'm sure some there's discrepancies between companies in terms of the content, as well as the potency, you know, like is a one gram pre-roll the same for every single company? Yeah, probably not. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. And that's when, if it's sold at a dispensary, that's when you can look at the certificate of analysis to just like make sure like for, for your own like quality control of your research to, right. to get the, the certificate of analysis to know exactly like, yeah, um, what is in this. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many different products that are out there and I, I need to go back and find this, the study, but it was like in a lot of products that are sold as CBD products, like they actually don't really have that much CBD in them. I think I remember, I either remember seeing something like that, or I thought I remembered hearing you or somebody else talking about that. Um, it's like, they, yeah, they, they did a, yeah. they basically did a product test to see like, is there as much CBD in here as they claim? Right. Yeah. Right. And, and it's, it's also interesting um, that, I mean, there's just so many different variables to consider with cannabis i mean uh -huh. even so with with like an edible it's or, or like a pill or something like that you know at what time points how long do you keep the participant like in the lab because uh -huh. um, you know it's, it's a it can be a big time commitment for participants to come in for exercise physiology studies like they might have to come in you know a couple of times a week or like sometimes like multiple times for multiple trials so yeah it's like really it can it can be a lot to do that kind of research. And so to really think about before you even get into it, it's all right, we're taking edibles for this study, which means that we might, you know, do some measures at baseline and then an hour in and then maybe two hours in. And like, do you need to stay, do they need to stay there for longer? Like, is that important or not? Versus smoking, you know, which would mm -hmm. have like a faster onset. So do they need to stay there for the same length of time? And uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that, that's a 
good question. So uh, both my PhD uh, mentor, Ben, and one of the other PhD students uh, at the time, Chris, did some work on primarily looking at hydration and alcohol. And one of the things they had to have in place for that study or those studies was um, the participants weren't allowed to leave until they were legally underneath the uh, alcohol limit, the driving limit yeah. for alcohol in Australia. We can't, you know, we don't have a way to do that in with cannabis. I mean, even if we were collecting blood, I don't think there is a very good link between THC and the blood and, and cognitive impairment right. um, per se. You know, so like even if somebody had been in the lab for four hours and these are just arbitrary numbers I'll throw out, but, you know, let's say their the THC in their blood was like 50 and the limit is, I don't know, 50 or 25 or whatever. How would we really know if they're safe to, to right. drive? And yeah, and that's, that is another one of the big challenges I think we have. And then there's also issues regarding their, um, I haven't specifically looked into um, the metabolism of the THC, for example, and whether there's a genetic component to that. Mm -hmm. So kind of coming back to caffeine, the CYP1-alpha-2 enzyme, which is in the liver, metabolizes about 95% of caffeine in the body. And there are pretty much two different types of people. There's fast metabolizers who clear caffeine more rapidly and seem to not have any or have less issues with side effects compared to the slow metabolizers who the caffeine's half-life or how long it is in the blood basically is, is longer. It's more exaggerated yeah. and they seem to be more susceptible to the adverse side effects like increased anxiety, jitteriness, um, stomach issues, things like that. Interesting. And I, I would assume that there's probably something similar with cannabis, but I don't think anybody has really looked at that. Yeah, um, no idea. I wouldn't even know where to begin, but I'm I know, sure there are like genetic about, like, differences about like levels in the system or something, like looking at like the endocannabinoid, you know, system in general or something. I don't know. Interesting. Because like one of the other things to control for is length of use and familiarity with cannabis because, um, and I think- and I need to, you know, look back at the research and what the research says now, but from my recollection in terms of like the driving studies is that people who are more chronic, <laughs> which is funny, uh, chronic <laughs> users, uh, people who've been using for longer periods of time, the deficits are less than people who are more new to cannabis, which makes sense. In yeah. Terms of and I learning. think that lines up with what I've seen too. Yeah. Have, and so like problem. now you have to look at the familiarity with um of cannabis use. One of the one of the studies that I like to hate on, which I need to <laughs> find a better way of describing that, is um there a study from Australia where they were looking at gait. Like does cannabis use or a can history of cannabis use affect uh your walking, you know, pattern? And so when you look at the methods, when you look at the actual subjects, they had the cannabis group had um, people who've been who've used six times in their life to people who use like over a thousand times and then and like the only significant difference i mean obviously the significant difference between cannabis use and the cannabis group versus the controls but um there's also a significant difference in alcohol use and so like there's so much research that shows alcohol affects your gait i mean like you have eyes as well you can see that, like al alcohol affects the way that you walk and so it's like, we, we actually can't tell from the study that, you know, that cannabis affects gait, like that makes no sense. And so it's like really important to look at length of use and how that affects performance in addition to all these other variables about, you know, what product they're using, how much, like what percent of THC versus CBD, like what about a 28% THC versus a 16% THC? What about a, like a certain terpene profile versus another one? And it's, concentrate <laughs> versus distillate versus like whole resin or live resin entourage effect so much <laughs> so much stuff so much stuff and the other one that has kind of come into my um reference point recently is looking at how the cannabis was grown and so similar to like you know organic 
fruit and, <laughs> fruits and vegetables versus like GMO, <laughs> genetically modified fruits and vegetables. It's like they do the same thing with with cannabis. And so it's like what happens with like an outdoor no you know, no pesticide kind of stuff, strains versus like things that are grown indoor and, um, and like have a lot of the GMO kind of stuff to it. Yeah. That's a, you know, a great question too. I was wondering the same, you know, as you started talking about it, I was like, oh man, that's a really good question is if like, yeah, do indoor big brand name cannabis companies that do most of their growing indoors. And so like, yeah, do those products have a different chemical profile, especially with combustion compared to a product that's grown outdoors right exactly well we can run that study uh, i think that yeah is that it more, could be doable is it more indoor growing down san marcos you know that's a good question i probably because most of the part of the county that i live in is a bit too urbanized mm -hmm. to really sustain outdoor, outdoor growth. Growing practices <laughs> yeah you got to go you got to go east a bit kind of into the national forest lands to find them but even then i don't know if this part of the state, it, I mean, I'm sure there is a lot of growth going on that I just don't know about, but weather-wise, I just don't know if it's the right environment for the plants. Because oh, um, I think cannabis needs a decent amount of water, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. And I mean, like there's, um, there are people who live like near, um, near water and they can do dry farming, I guess. I don't know. There's like all these other, like there's a whole world of farming and growing stuff that I'm just, I don't know what you guys are talking about, mm -hmm. but it sounds super interesting. And I wonder how it affects humans. <laughs> yeah. I, I always get, so we're starting a cannabis studies program um, on our campus. We'll have our first round of students next fall, but um, this fall we'll, we'll have our first class about Humboldt and cannabis, about the culture. When we were trying to develop the the program, similar to like any kind of academia, everyone thinks that their own like view of the world is the most important thing. And so it's like, well, no, we definitely need to make sure that we have something about business. So no, we definitely need something about psychology. No, we definitely need something about um, soil sciences. Like, oh no, we need to talk about, talk about water rights and how that, that like talks, you know, relates to land use and forestry. And it's just like, oh my God, there's like so many other other things. And, and I keep on coming back to like, the reason why anyone is even growing any of this stuff is for people to use it. So we have to understand uh -huh. why humans use it and how it actually affects humans. People are not growing it so that mice can get high. They're, they're growing it and it's being sold in stores so that people can feel these effects. And so it's frustrating for me. I mean, obviously I'm like seeing my own, my own little world here, but yeah, I think it's so important to look at all these different factors about how cannabis actually affects human bodies. And so it's, I, I think it's a really interesting model, you know, cause there, there is a lot of research on that, that medical side as well of just like, this is going to help kids with a seizure disorder. And like, mm -hmm again, so happy that people are doing that. And like, I can kind of go into that world a little bit from like my medical kind of background, but it's like, no, like I, I kind of, I, I'm in this, my own phase of my own understanding of science and, and my own relationship with exercise, honestly, at this point is like, we need people to move their bodies more. All exercise is good. You know, you just need people, people can totally overdo exercise. And that's when I see exercise as bad. But like movement is is really important. And so if people like moving their bodies more when they're high, like, yeah, we need to investigate this. If people are able to um, to sleep more at the end of the night after exercise and able to like, you know, get um, on a better like training regimen because of that sleep, like, yeah, that's important to know. There's so much research that shows exercise is important for like mental health, physical health, chronic disease. It's all these different things. And so I think this is a really important way of looking at at our field of kinesiology and um, in the reality of legalization of cannabis. Yeah. And I, I think whether people want to admit it or not, I think there is a bit of just like there is a relationship between alcohol and exercise. I think people probably don't want to see it, but I feel like there is a pretty good relationship between cannabis and exercise as well. Totally. So it, it it's a cultural connection. And so with alcohol, for example, you know, very common after a game or a match, go out, have some drinks and celebrate or, you know, beer garden at the end of a half marathon or whatever. Yeah. 
And we don't really concern ourselves too much with the potentially negative impacts that that alcohol consumption is having. Or like even like bowling, like bowling and drinking. Yeah. You know, like I'm usually better at bowling after a drink or two. And it's, but after three, it goes downhill again. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) I wonder how much that's going to change, like with the legalization, like, are there, I mean, there was like the, the 420 or what was it? There was some kind of running event where it's a 4.2 mile run. And I'm not going to remember what it's called now, of course, but I went to it in San Francisco a couple years ago where, yeah, like they- Was it, it like was, a beer mile, but with cannabis? Sort of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. That exactly. And so- kind of fun, actually. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And so expect that there's going to be more events like that in the future, like as cannabis becomes more and more legal and like as people talk more and more about cannabis use and their own uh, exercise- and sport that that there will be more events that are like cannabis and and exercise focused and that might be where we can do some research that doesn't involve the university at all anymore (laughs) yes Uh, or you have to pick like a a sport or activity where use might be a bit high right pun intended yeah Um, exactly like ultra running i anecdotally i hear that that's pretty popular um totally in Mm -hmm. terms of cannabis use and then in terms of the uh recruitment for a study I'm running right now. Most of the cannabis users I've gotten have come from a rock climbing gym. Um, Uh So, you know, you can insert your own stereotypes there, but based on the work that you've done, as well as other survey studies, you know, the number or the diversity of different types of exercise we have people doing under the influence of cannabis is really quite eye-opening. Totally. Because it, it was never really something I had considered. Like I had there were always like urban legends in high school about like the greatest athlete our school had, you know, he used to like smoke before practice or whatever and things like that. No idea how much of it is any is true sure. yeah. uh, or anything like that. But, you know, you, you hear urban legends like, Oh yeah, that person smoked before they went and did whatever. And yeah, well, and it's, I mean, um, there's just so many different types of activities that people participate in under the influence of cannabis. The thing that was interesting to me is that it's not like, it seems like a big thing in the ultra running. So it's like, all right, that's like more of an aerobic kind of exercise. Like, is it more common in aerobic exercise or anaerobic exercise? And like with aerobic exercise where like, you know, you need more oxygen to be able to sustain it. Then like, how does, how does smoking affect aerobic exercise versus an anaerobic performance? And so versus like an edible and aerobic performance versus an edible and anaerobic exercise. There's just so many different variables. <laughs> I'm just like constantly thinking about ideas of, of research and stuff. But yeah, last, was it kind of, was that last summer when you started to work on that survey? I think it was summer of 2020. Ooh. All right. <laughs> Feels like a lot longer ago than that, but. Oh my goodness. Good time is, uh. It's not the same as real time. Exactly. Somehow it's like August of 22. Um, mm. <laughs> tell me more about that study. Yeah. So um, the genesis was kind of looking at some of the survey work that had been done at that time. I know you were, I think at that time you were working up on writing up your stuff. Yeah. And there had been a couple of fairly good surveys that basically showed people were using it around exercise and a few of the reasons why, but it didn't really like dig down into that deeper kind of nitty gritty. And so what we were particularly interested in is when are people using it around exercise and what are kind of the reasons why? Mm -hmm. Um, So not necessarily before versus after, we wanted to look at both. Yeah. And kind of regardless of when people were taking it, either before, after, or both, the primary reasons seem to have largely been due to what we term psychological reasons, which I think lines up with what you found and what other people have found Mm -hmm. as well. So they're doing it for the purpose of basically make themselves feel better or make the exercise feel better or Mm -hmm. possibly to be more, this was explained to me by another participant, to to just be more present and to make what they are currently doing more enjoyable because yeah. for this individual when they participated in can when they use cannabis it it's to help them basically enjoy more whatever it is they're doing whether that's right. eating or watching tv or exercising or whatever which is kind of eye-opening to me because if and this is a really really big if i want to put that there as a caveat if for some reason we can show or get evidence that cannabis use improves people's kind of attitude towards exercise, 
then is that something we could potentially turn into as a way to increase adherence to exercise? Because we know one of the big issues with exercise interventions is dropout, mm -hmm. whether that's due to injury, boredom, or you know whatever. And so if some sort of pharmacological supplement, if you will, could be used in conjunction with exercise to increase exercise behavior, then I would all, I would be all for it. Totally. If, you know, we showed that it was safe and all that sort of stuff. So theoretically in the long term, that could improve adherence, which could right. potentially improve health at the end of the day, which I think right. is the overall goal and also adopting behaviors. And so that might be something else to kind of think about is if there is any sort of connection between like, not necessarily risk taking, because I know that that's been looked at, but maybe if there's any sort of relationship between cannabis use and either new physical activities or just new hobbies, activities in general. Behavior. So like, yeah, exactly. yeah, do, do cannabis use, are, more, are cannabis users more likely to adopt new things? Because I actually I saw a post on social media earlier today. One of the things we don't like to do as adults is new stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and you see me on social media all the time, always trying new stuff. <laughs> you do, yeah. And I give you major props for that. As a daily cannabis user, I can say that I like learning new stuff all the time. And one of the things that I really appreciate about cannabis or like something that I'm, I'm noticing about learning new skills and cannabis is that I don't. Well, first of all, like I know the science about motor learning and, and so like I know that you have to make errors and like you get better by correcting your errors. And so like I'm not freaked out by making mistakes, you know, just in general. But yeah, I mean, cannabis definitely helps me like really not care if I fall while trying to do a slack line, like, or, you know, I don't care if I go slower doing the Rubik's cube, or like, I don't care if I don't get up into a handstand, you just do more, you know, and, and yeah, it definitely takes that pressure off that like pressure when you're trying to get good at something when you're like, no, I screwed it up. And, and it's like, I don't say that to myself when I'm practicing new skills under the influence of cannabis. But that's a whole nother study that I want to do is how how does, how does cannabis affect your performance? And so like, is there more movement variability? Like, do you end up trying different strategies when you're under, under the influence of cannabis? So maybe you don't acquire the skill as fast because you're trying a bunch of different things, but end up, uh, this is what I'm theorizing. I'm, I'm guessing that because you're trying a lot of different things and feel that sense of control and like not getting and having that growth kind of mindset in that state, that it will lead to better retention of skills. So more, you actually learn the skill uh, more roundly than um, if you were like really hardcore, like, all right, when we go into practice today, everyone has to do like, you know, this kind of protocol when you're juggling. It's all right, we're just going in here and juggling today. Like how many reps do you guys want to do? So yeah, I'm, I I would love to do a, some like a some kind of motor learning study about that and then see how that relates then to like exercise adherence. And so like, because once you do get a new activity, it makes you want to practice it more. Mm -hmm. And so once you do start walking every day, well, maybe you're walking every day while smoking a dog walker, like a little like mini joint, mm -hmm. you know, maybe that helps you go for a walk every day. And so like, now that you've gotten into that habit, are you more likely to actually continue to do that? I think it's just fascinating. All right, cool. Any other dream research that you want to do? Yeah. So uh, I would love to go back to the studies from the sixties and the seventies where that was really the last time they did any sort of exercise and cannabis research, if for nothing else, just because so much has changed since then, especially in regards to cannabis itself. It's more potent. It's more readily available. It is in more forms. I think every one of those studies used a joint because yep. um, I don't think... The and they, and they did really that existed because, back then. Um, that was the most common way of people actually smoking at the time. And in one study, it said they they took people who were already smokers, maybe like smoke cigarettes, because they physically knew how to, how to inhale correctly. And so it's like, oh, you took a bunch of cigarette smoke. Like that's a confounding variable. Like, oh my God, you didn't control for that and performance. And then, but yeah, so like that was the smoking was the, was the primary mode of uh, application. And then- um, it was usually like less than 5% THC as well, which is just yeah. like, you don't even see that at dispensaries. That's nothing. <laughs> exactly. And I think most of them used a uh, exercise test to exhaustion, which that's well and good. It's a fair way to assess somebody's 
fitness and their VO2 max. But if you're looking at it from the standpoint of athletes, for example, that doesn't translate directly to performance. And if I'm not mistaken, I think almost all of the studies that were done mostly looked at cardiovascular and respiratory variables. So there was some like hand grip stuff too, I think. Okay. Oh, you're right. I think there was one that did hand grip. Yeah. yeah. So that opens up the question of like, okay, well, let's look at a real resistance exercise session. Yeah. Although given you know, some of the acute cardiovascular effects of cannabis consumption and some of the acute cardiovascular effects of resistance exercise, that might not be a good combo, but it could also depend on the population you're looking at. In, you know, healthy, young, college-age males, probably not an issue. But if you're looking at a 60-plus-year-old lifelong cannabis user who's never lifted weights before, then, you know, you might run into some issues of the Valsalva maneuver and causing cardiovascular strain. But Right. But like, I mean, with even with like the long term cannabis users who are in their 60s, there are people who are daily pot smokers in their 60s and have been for decades. And so uh, probably up more up here in Humboldt than <laughs> anywhere else in the United States. But but even with them, it's like, all right, how does cannabis affect balance? You know, like you don't have to put someone under cardiovascular strain to actually see how how um, cannabis might affect just life. And I know that older adults are like, is the fastest growing group of cannabis users in the country. And so, it's, yeah, it actually will be important to look at older adults specifically. And again, to look at that novel, like novice versus um, long-term user. I think we could probably do even just like lung volumes of people who've just been, you know, smoking for, you know, different lengths of time, you know, like, does this affect your residual volume? Does this affect your like inspiratory reserve volume? And so I'm, I'm, it's like, there's so much stuff that we can look at. <laughs> and unfortunately, like a lot of that, a lot of data on those kind of variables comes from studies like um, the NHANES and some of these larger data sets where cannabis use was like assessed with a single question yeah. And they're classifying people as chronic users based on a single answer and then just throwing statistics at it and <laughs> seeing what, you know, what comes out. Yeah. And so that's why like so many of these epidemiological studies for the most part are pretty much showing null results for whether cannabis is harmful. Yeah. And like for the most part, the answer according to the literature is either no or not enough data. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And so while I think there is a place for those sorts of studies where you can get, you know, four, five, six thousand or something respondents, nothing will beat bringing these people into the lab or doing actual testing on these people and, you know, being able to get a better idea about their exposures. Because in these epidemiological studies, I mean, I'm not an epidemiologist, but if I was and I was classifying exposure to something from one question, that just seems a bit suspicious to me. Yeah. But it's it's all we have. Right. And that begs the question, is something better than nothing? But yeah, so that's like, but yeah, it just, it raises so many questions uh, about like metabolic health. Cause you know, for the most part, there's no evidence that cannabis use is associated with disruptions to like glucose metabolism. There doesn't seem to be a link with increased risk of diabetes. Mm -hmm. The idea of this couch bound, you know, overweight, obese cannabis user, there's not really literature to support that. You know, we have, I think there's four, there's three or four epidemiological studies that have analyzed data from some of these big databases and have found in like two out of the three, cannabis users actually have more activity than non-users, according and, to both self-report and, like and less, accelerometers. Yeah. And and also way less and have like less percentage yes. like that. Yeah. They have lower BMI and waist circumferences, which is again not something we would expect. Mm-hmm. Um, but what if that's related to tobacco co-use? Because we know when people are using tobacco, they tend to be leaner. It's when they quit that they start you know, mm-hmm. gaining weight. Mm-hmm. Um, what else? Inflammatory markers. Not really any clear differences there. Same thing with uh, mm-hmm. triglycerides, fats in the blood. And so there's yeah. just, there's so many questions and so many things that we would 
kind of like to, I mean, I would just love to go and set up camp outside of like a dispensary. And as people come out, just be like, all right, let me get a blood sample. Let's do a pulmonary function test. Yep. Um, if you want to, you can come into the lab and do a VO2 max test or, yep. you know, things like that. And that would be, I, yeah, that would be ideal. But then I wonder how ethical is that? <laughs> I mean, yeah, we'd have to kind of clarify exactly, like, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. like, you know, do do some of the background on that. But that would be so interesting. Oh, my gosh. Well, I could talk about, like, research ideas all day long. And, um, oh, gosh, the other thing that I wrote down as we were talking, um, you wrote about appetite and, like, caffeine and, and how that affects appetite. Yes. Yeah. And so uh, on one of the other podcast episodes, I don't know why this is blowing my mind so much, but, like, this is an MMA fighter who grew up wrestling. And so in, um, in wrestling, you have to cut weight, which is like a pretty screwed up thing that we have teenage kids doing, uh, of like really restricting their calorie intake and increasing their, um, their exercise and like to drop a stupid amount of weight, like, like a really unhealthy amount of weight in a small amount of time. And so this person was saying like, oh yeah, they, they just don't have that hunger response anymore like they don't ever feel hungry because they had to dampen that down for so many years mm -hmm. that sometimes they they smoke weed just to like help them eat and that's another area that's kind of interesting to me because i follow some people on social media that work with some of the professional cycling teams yeah um and they, they just finished the tour de france for example and one of the challenges that they run into during the 21 days of the tour is getting these guys to eat enough calories to replace what they burn yeah and so in some cases could cannabis be ergogenic in that sense like could they finish their stage get off the bike smoke a joint to stimulate their appetite yeah and you know help them get the calories in that they need um you know obviously there's been i think some work in cancer patients who obviously we want to stimulate their appetite but in mm -hmm. You know, in other populations, like what about anorexia nervosa uh, yeah, or, are, or bulimia or some yep. of these other conditions where, like uh, you kind of hinted at, people have conditioned themselves to basically ignore their internal hunger cues. Yeah. So can we give them something that'll stimulate them externally? Well, I guess and internally, given the actions of cannabis on the endocannabinoid system and... I don't remember its full name, but I want to say it's 2AG, mm -hmm. one of the endocannabinoids. That one is pretty heavily involved in the appetite system, and all the endocannabinoids are involved in hedonics or pleasure-seeking yeah. uh, and pleasure-seeking behavior. And so yeah. that is another area that would be potentially interesting is do cannabis users experience or perceive like pleasure differently? Oh, super interesting. Or, you know, are they desensitized because yeah. of the cannabis use or are they hypersensitized? I don't know. I'd love to do some brain imaging stuff. I'd love to see some brain imaging stuff or fMRI stuff where, you know, you get chronic users versus non-users. You show them pictures of uh, usually this paradigm. They put them in an MRI scanner and they show them pictures of things like flowers as a control, and then pictures of different types of food. And they basically look at how the blood flow in the brain changes. Uh, basically, it becomes brighter with more blood flow. And we know that in individuals with obesity, um, they are hypersensitive to the high fat, high sugar food cues. Interesting. So their brain lights up like a Christmas tree when they see pictures of those. And pretty much gets no response in response to things like flowers or healthy food. Huh. So I would love to know if what that looks like in, in chronic cannabis users as well. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Wow. Well, as, as we've now discussed, there's so many <laughs> opportunities for research. And so if any, there, if there's any other researchers who are out there, um, welcome. There's, we, there's room for all of us. There's, there's always room for more studies, always room for more collaborations. And so i um, super grateful that we've been able to connect here and to um, talk about research. Um, you know, for me to go through my first survey study that I'd ever done, like right when I first started this job. And then when you were developing your survey, it was like, oh, I asked that same question 
I don't know what the results mean. Don't ask that question. Or like, oh, you, you, you know, frame the question this way. Like now that I know some things, I think that they're, and just from my experience talking to other um, researchers in cannabis, like they've all been so awesome. There's, there's not that level of cutthroat, oh, I'm doing this thing. It's like, there's room for all of us. And so um, for anyone who's a researcher, um, you know, there's, there's so many different labs that are starting to do this kind of research. And so, you know, reach out to people like we're all, we're usually pretty cool people, uh, <laughs> pretty cool uh, researchers. Pretty and, mellow. Uh, pretty mellow, pretty chill, you know, good vibes. Um <laughs> For any other researchers out there who want to collaborate, um, you know, super down to collaborate on stuff. So many different research ideas to do in the future and psych to see what the future holds. I think that I'll probably have you on um, some more and uh, we can probably go through some more research together so we can talk through some studies. Thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to learn more, you can follow me on Instagram at Exploring Cannabis and Exercise or at Dr. Ogle. Or you can visit my website at WhitneyOgle.com. If you want to support this podcast, you can sign up for Patreon at Patreon.com slash Exploring Cannabis and Exercise. This podcast was produced by Haley Montowski, and the music used on this podcast is called Bonfire Cauliflower, created by Isaac Joel. Make good choices out there. <laughs>